This is session two on preventing the dismantling of America. In our last session, we dealt with how the elite were talking about wanting to dismantle America and some things that we could do about it. Uh, in this lesson, one of the things that I learned uh, when I first went into the military is you got to know your enemy. If you don't, you end up, there's something in warfare called friendly fire. And in the body of Christ, too many times we have friendly fire because we have never defined who the enemy is, what his doctrine is, uh, what his uniforms are, what his tactics are. And if we don't know that, we have no way of really dealing with the elite, with the Illuminati, and how they do things in the world. Uh, today, most Christians have no idea what the enemy is doing in our world, what his ways are, the doctrines of his warfare. Because of this, much of the body of Christ has been rendered ineffective spiritually and are no longer salt of the earth. And I want to show you something that Jesus shared with us in Matthew 5.13. It says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if, need to underline that in your Bible, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. We need to understand that salt not only makes one thirsty, and we always, we always hear people talk about that, how that the Christian is supposed to make people thirsty to know God. But the primary thing that salt was used before the modern preservatives was that they would they would pack meat and salt, they would pack different things in salt because salt preserves. That when the body of Christ is operating righteously, when it is walking in the ways of God, it, it preserves the culture around it. It can preserve the nature around it. It can preserve the world around it. But if we lose being salt, we cease to preserve anything, and we become rancid ourselves. Now, I want you to notice, because because this kind of touches on the doctrine of Balaam, that he said, now, if you have lost your savor, if you have lost walking in holiness, if you have lost walking in righteousness, you will be trodden under the foot of man. Now, this isn't Moses talking here. This is Jesus and see, that's one of the things that Balaam learned, that if Balaam could get the people of God to adopt pagan things and begin moving in pagan ways, that God would take his hand of protection off of them and he could attack them. One of the things that the elite told Chaplain Williams was that we had to move God away, or America, away from God. And so one of the things I want to begin doing tonight is just looking at some of the ways that they have done it. It's not going to be exhaustive. In fact, I'm probably going to refer you to several other things that you can read. A part of the call of the trained of God, Unit 318, is we are going to have to re-educate ourselves. We need to understand history. We need to understand things like the French Revolution and how that became the hallmark, the trading card, or the pattern uh, that is used to dismantle nations. And it was used by Lenin. It was used by Mao. It was used by a lot of others uh, to, to take apart sophisticated, cultured societies. And it's time for the body of Christ to begin being salt in the earth again, but we've got to realize that the, the, the Illuminati and paganism has been working a long, long time to infiltrate itself into us. Now, one of the things that uh, we don't understand about Moloch, Moloch was one of the Babylonian gods, that, it would, that you would offer up your children, and the, the Bible talks about having your children, you shall not have your children pass through the fire. But how many of us today, we, we, we forget to realize that Moloch was the God of prosperity and pleasure. And when the church is all caught up in prosperity and nothing else, you find yourself serving Molech and not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, the entire, entire abortion industry is for the profit of the elite and so that women can have pleasure without consequences. It's kind of the same thing. And so we need to understand that Moloch has a hold in much of the church. It seems like almost every, no, every truth of God is reduced down to an offering. 
Hey, God has feasts. Time for an offering. Here's this revelation. Now we're going to turn it into the $500 offering. How many know that is not the way the kingdom of God is supposed to operate? The tithe belongs to God, and when it's time to build for the kingdom, the Bible says God's people give for a purpose, and the purpose is like building the tabernacle. They were giving for a purpose of God, not for God to make them rich. There is something when you begin living the ways of God, God prospers you. You don't chase after prosperity like you do with Molech. You chase after God and begin walking in holiness and true wisdom, biblical wisdom, and it will cause you to prosper. But Molech demanded a gift whether it's a check, a child, and see us running after prosperity, can we now say that the youth in this generation is not walking through fire, the fires of hell? Now, his wife, Zashtaroth, at, in fact, you, a lot of times you would have uh, Ashtaroth and Moloch on the same altar, but they're, they're just a rehash of, of Nimrod, Samarimus, Tammuz, uh, same thing. In fact, these ones of uh, Ashtaroth is also Easter, Ishtar, Diana, um, Lilith. The names change. Some of the, some of the mythology changes, but it's the same thing. But what's interesting is Ashtaroth was over uh, the temple prostitutes in, in the Babylonian temples and is directly connected with explicit and perverted sex as well as pornography. When men allow themselves to be entered into pornography, they are giving homage to Ashtoreth. And how many know right now in the church, pornography is rampant? Because if you have the one, Molech, you will always have his wife, the goddess, with him, and so the prosperity leads into all kinds of other pleasures that are forbidden by God. And they know that this weakens the people of God. You cannot do this and stand against what they want to do in the earth. you got to walk according to the word of God. What God said is holy will always be holy. What God said is unclean will always be unclean. It doesn't matter how many you can march on Washington. It doesn't matter how many man-made laws that you pass. It does not change the eternal word of God. Now, I'm going to get into some things tonight about the Illuminati. But I also want to give credit where credit is due. Doc Marquis was a seventh generation Illuminist. He wasn't like Bill Sneblin trying to work his way from just being a Satanist and, and a Mason and work his way on up uh, in, into Luciferianism. He was born that way, that his family was from one of the 13 bloodlines that are Illuminati bloodlines, so at the age of three, he was consecrated to Lucifer, and he was trained up till the age of 13. They have kind of the counter to a bar mitzvah, where he would actually begin to establish and begin to have jurisdictions and rule and do different things. And, but praise God, he got saved. And so he has dedicated his life to teaching people about the Illuminati. Uh, in fact, uh, here a couple of weeks ago, uh, when I was at the Future Congress by Dr. Tom Horn, I got to sit down with Doc and, and hash out a few things because there's, uh, there's as much misinformation as there is information on the Illuminati. They love to do that. Uh, it, it's, it's like an attorney that says, well, this, this company that I'm suing has one document that will prove that my case is right. And so when they request that document, they will stuff it in the midst of 10,000 documents and send them it all. And then you got to ferret out what, what is real. The Illuminati love to do that. They love to play those games. But he has an eight DVD set. Uh, and here with, uh, at Survival Mall, Dr. Tom Horn has them. Uh, right here it's advertising six, but he's just added two more. Uh, if you want to go beyond what I'm going to be teaching, uh, this is an excellent set. Plus you get to uh, uh, support a man of God that has, been, has had many uh, attempts on his life. He's been poisoned and all kinds of things because they want to shut him up. Now, the Illuminati officially was founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. Uh, Weishaupt was the professor of canon law at Ingolstadt University in Bavaria, and he was a professor and held that 
that chair at the age of 21. Uh, he was a genius. But what we need to also understand is that he did not start this. This originates in Babylon. What he did is he was hired by the Rothschilds to come up with a devised plan to fulfill their agenda and to bring all the fragmented groups of the, of, of, of the occult together so they could move together as a force. And so he did that. In fact, one of his mottos, we see e pluribus unum, which is uh, supposed to be a slogan for the United States, out of many, one. What he did is he went to all the elite, all the, the universities. He found the, the brightest and the best in the royalty of Europe. And, he, and out of those, he extrapolated and initiated people into the Illuminati and to begin to use their brain power and to get them involved with what he wanted to do. Uh, in fact, what we need to realize, and we're, we're going to touch on here just in a minute, is that even the American seal that we see here, as well as the reverse, is not just the American seal. It's the seal of the Illuminati. In fact, originally, if you look here on the other side of the screen, uh, that doesn't look like an eagle, does it? That was the original seal that when they finally wore it out, they slowly amalgamated and kind of hit it as an eagle. That's a phoenix. Because out of the death of, of the current world order, a new phoenix is going to rise up of a new world order. And every bit of, of all that is within this, and Doc does a much better job on his videos than I can, he shows how that these are actually the seals. And what's interesting is the Secretary of State is required whenever we have a treaty, and you're supposed to put both sides of the seal on that treaty, and she carries them or he carries them, depending upon who's Secretary of State. They only have this side. The other side with the, the pyramid, they don't have. Our own nation doesn't have, but the Illuminati does. In fact, what's really interesting about the seals, for years, Thomas Jefferson was trying to come up with a design, and while he was out kind of walking in his garden in the cool of the evening, a hooded figure walked up to him and handed him the seals. This is, uh, this is documented in many of Chris Pinto's videos, uh, Riddles in Stone and some others. Uh, find it fascinating that Americans weren't even the ones who designed the seals. They were handed to us from the Illuminati. Um, in fact, Doc, according to uh, his figures, and I forgot to write the exact year down. I had it in my notes from our conversation. But he was taught as an Illuminist that Freemasonry was completely taken over uh, by the Illuminati in, I want to say, 1865, 1862, around there. Uh, even George Washington in his writings was said, I fear the Illuminati are already functioning in America. And so by 18-something, 1862 or so, uh, they had completely taken over Freemasonry, and they've taken over many other organizations. Now, we need to understand what is their religion, because one of the things I'm going to begin doing is introducing you to some of their tokens, some of their symbols that they will embed everywhere. But those that are not, haven't studied these things and don't recognize them, guys, I mean, it's really getting belligerent. I, I, I meant to uh, scan a copy. Of it. it was an ad for a pulpit company that makes those see-through pulpits. And in their ad, they had a a uh, pulpit from a missionary Baptist church, and I guess, I, I guess it, I'm not sure which, because there's four or five different missionary Baptist churches, but instead of a cross, it had an ink this big on the front of the pulpit. How many know an ink ain't a cross? <laughs> it's an Egyptian sign of eternal life, and it's about reincarnation. And we have become so inept at their symbolism that we can't even tell the difference anymore. They, they, have, they have reduced us down while they're, they're continuing to uh, better themselves and educate themselves. They're completely devoted to what they do. And we're sitting here halfway doing things and wondering why they have gotten such a stronghold when they put everything up out in front of us, but we don't have the education. We have never trained ourselves to recognize what paganism is. And so they've embedded it into the Christian church, and nobody knows. And because of the grace of God, we get away with it for 100 or 200 years, and now we make it a tradition. 
Okay. <laughs> the Illuminati actually started not in 1776. That was when they were organized by Adam Westhoff. But they were, it goes all the way back to Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Uh, Weishoff was commissioned by the Rothschilds to develop a plan to bring all the occult paganism together. And what they're looking for is they're trying by, by using world events. Uh, I just saw a, another video by, Dr., uh, by Doc Marquis that bloodshed is one of the ways they can bring what they call, what we call the Antichrist, they call the king of despots. And they're looking for him coming because he's going to bring a lot of information, the missing pieces of the puzzle they don't have, he will bring with him. And so they, they also believe that the 33rd parallel is a very strategic parallel on the earth. And what's interesting, it runs right through Iraq and, and, uh, and some of the nations we're fighting right now. So all the bloodshed in those areas serve their purpose. See, we're not taught a lot of this stuff. But we need to understand that they are completely committed to everything they do while we have been playing church. Now, it started in Babylon, and we've got to understand that the one thing that uh, Brother Lindsey Williams had wrong is their religion is not evolution. You can kind of, it, it is reincarnation. It started in Babylon. Nimrod was killed by Shem. Uh, Samarimus said, well, uh, he's going to, uh, he, he ascended. He became one of the first ascended masters and he became the sun god. But then he was reincarnated into Tammuz. And so this is a reincarnation wheel. And what's interesting about their belief systems, guys, is that they believe that every human sacrifice they do, they're actually doing the individual a favor. Because he, he wasn't reincarnated properly or evolved enough, if you will. He, 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 he might have downgraded with the last life instead of upgraded. So they can put him on that wheel and the sacrifice, and the next time he comes back around, he may come up to a better slot. Especially since he was sacrificed to Lucifer, he, he'll, get a, he'll get, you know, one up on the, on the ladder. But we also need to realize, because this is their mindset they will give their own lives for their cause, believing that they will come back again to begin working the plan again. So kill me now, I'm reborn, and then once, once I grow up, I'll be trained and be given, given more information uh, to be able to have, uh, to bring the pan to pass. They always think of, many times in, in Christianity, we think of next week, we think of you know, next year, I mean, it's really radical that churches are having a, a one-year, five-year, even a 10-year plan. Some have more than that. that. That concept was really radical. These people have plans that span multi-generations. Because in their own mind, they have been taught that if they die working the plan, they'll get to come back, pick up right back where they were, where advanced, and take it up to the next level. And here we are, we can't even plan more than a week. Now, I want to get into some of the things that they're, they're Luciferian in what they believe. And we're not taught a lot about that. They believe that Yahweh and Lucifer co-created the earth together. So, Lucifer is equal to Yahweh. And Jesus was just a lower angel according to their doctrine. Yahweh became jealous of Lucifer, especially when he began to offer man the next step, the, that, that missing key to godhood, that, God, that Yahweh stopped immediately and said, you're not going to eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so then the war was on between Yahweh and Lucifer, and they believe one day uh, that they will have enough of mankind united together for their cause to overthrow Yahweh, and that Lucifer will become the ruling god of this universe. And that is the sole purpose of everything they do. They, they control all the money for that purpose. They control all of our energy resources for that purpose. They control almost every government on the planet for that purpose to create the proper spiritual climate 
for the king of despots to come, and when he comes, he will set the stage where Lucifer can win. They believe at the end of Revelation that Jesus loses and that Lucifer wins because they get enough people on their side. Now, notice the, the wheel. One of the things you're going to find out is this wheel concept is universal uh, for occultism. In fact, it's used again in the eight night in the eight uh, nights of required human sacrifice. And what's interesting is you'll see Yule, or the winter solstice, we call it Christmas, and it was eventually moved under, under the Julian calendar. It was December 25th was also the winter solstice, and it readjusted with the Gregorian calendar. But you'd be surprised when you look at these dates just how many of them also end up being Christian holidays or national holidays. It was interwoven and structured into our culture and into the church for a purpose. And they can also have things 13 days on either side of these can amalgamate into it. And Doc Marquis even shows that how between these, they, there's 13 weeks between each one of these. And so they do a six and a seven with something in the middle that marks that, always placing man over God. Because six is the number of man, seven is the number of God. All of their work is to suppress the knowledge of the God of the Bible so that Lucifer can rule and reign. Now, guys, these people, they're not running around in satanic garb. They're not the dabblers that we see with the tattoos from head to foot or the neo-Nazis. This is not what I'm talking about. These guys wear $5,000 suits. They're billionaires, trillionaires. Uh, the Rothschilds control almost all the banks of the world. The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. It is a centralized bank of international banking cartel that is run by the Rothschilds. In fact, to give you an idea of kind of why we're really in Iraq and why, we're, why Iran is kind of backing down on its stuff just a little bit and why we're in Afghanistan is there are seven nations that do not have centralized banks that the Rothschilds control. Let's see if you guys know the names. Libya is one. Iraq is one. Iran is one. Afghanistan is one. It's about banking. It's about money. It's about oil or pipelines. Every bit of it, guys. The terrorism that they created and we can go into all the symbolism, the occultic symbolism of that, that it was on 9-11. In the occult, you, 11 is the beginning of the work, or envisioning the work. 22, you put power behind the work, and at 33, you bring it to pass. And also, the Twin Towers not only formed in 11, and, and you almost can get 11 ad infinium when you begin comparing all the different things with the number 11, and, and one of the airliners had 11 had 11 crew member on the plane that hit one of the Twin Towers. But it also represents the twin pillars of Hercules that they must go through before they can begin the work. It all has occultic symbolism. Are you saying, Mike, that Al-Qaeda was not a part of this? No, I'm saying Al-Qaeda is a part of this. Come on. Because we need to realize that in Islam, there's a, there's a wonderful book called The Islamic Antichrist by Joel Richardson. And one of the things that everything that the king of despots is supposed to do, so does, uh, so does the Mahdi. And so it's tomato, tomato. They, they help create, I believe they help create that religion for a purpose that one of these days they're going to trip the trigger. He said, well, I, I want to know just how much they influence the world. Tower of Babel, the EU Parliament, made to be the Tower of Babel. See, I didn't include, I got one graphic where they actually have this tower, and it, and it has the, uh, the stars around it, just like in, in Babylon, and has the people becoming bricks. I, I forgot to insert that into this. Let's look at the influence they had in Europe. Now, the, Europe gets its name from Europa, which is this, 
woman riding the bull. Didn't they make this such a lovely kind of thing? It's just a woman, and she's riding a bull, and here's little dancing angels, and everything looks fine and wonderful. Do you know what this scene is actually called? The Rape of Europa. Does that look like a rape? Can you see how they kind of glass everything over? The story of Europa goes that she was a beautiful woman in the Middle East and that she went down swimming. But of course, back then they did not have uh, Speedos and, or bathing suits. They did it in the nude. And Zeus looked down and wanted to have her. And so he, he seduced her by becoming a bull, except unlike this one, he had huge crescent-shaped horns like Moloch or like the, 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 the bulls that we see out of, out of Egypt. And he came down and seduced her and violently raped her in the water. And she immediately conceived and had children. And the children were coming up out of the water that were demigods. And the, in um, the Revelation, he calls her the whore riding the beast. And every one of them, when he used that symbolism, they immediately understood the, the, that it was talking about Europa. And so I think there's actually a prophecy embedded in that that Europe will be raped by Islam and produce three beasts that will come up out of the water that we see in the book of Revelation. Now, how much more is, is this influence of the Illuminati in Europe? Well, we've got another picture here. It's a, it's a kind of a steel sculpture. And it's Europa riding the bull out in front of the legislative body for the EU. And then we have her down here riding the beast with seven heads. I mean, it's scary when you see some of how some of this stuff comes to pass. Here's an interesting one. Now, remember me telling you that this wheel is a universal symbol for the occult. And so when you look at the United Nations, on, you have the laurel leaves, which means to have victory over it. It was given to the victor. He would place them on his head in the Greek and Roman uh, times. So you have the world, and then you have a, a fancied up, but the, how many know that this, can you see the spokes are exactly the same? And so when you look at the UN, you see that the occult will have victory over the world through what the UN does. When you look at the UN's publishing company, it was originally called Lucifer Press. And then it, it began to kind of raise some, some scuffle about that, so they went to the Latin, Lucius Press. Guys, we need to understand. The... Cecil Rhodes, one of the, of the Cecil lines, Cecil is one of the 13 bloodlines, probably the second power, most powerful, the Rothschilds are the first. Um, he started something, he started round tables in every continent. The U.S. has two, the Trilateral Commission and Council on Formulations. Europe has its counter, the, each continent has their own. And it's, they, they get together to make their plans on how to bring their vision to pass. In fact, if you've ever seen anyone that was an exceptional person in college and they got a Rhodes Scholarship, they were brought to Oxford to learn how that their talents could be used by the Illuminati for world domination. In fact, we have had several presidents that were Rhodes Scholars. I mean, when you start connecting the dots, Oxford is one of the leading places that, that they're, they're carrying out the vision of Adam Weishaupt of, of out of many, they pull in the, the talented, the brightest, and begin to show them who really is running the world and to begin to discipline them and train them to use their craft to bring about the plans of the Illuminati. And if you ever really follow what the United Nations does, now there's some things they do, they do good because you've got to have a veneer. But if you start looking in Africa, many of the atrocities are done by UN soldiers. The torturing of children, the raping of women, UN soldiers, supposedly there to keep the peace. 
It's enforcing the plans of the Illuminati. We now have untold UN soldiers in America. Back during the, the Clinton administration, there was a questionnaire that he gave out to all US military. And one of the questions was kind of strange. It said that if laws were passed that outlawed weapons in America, would you fire on US citizens to get their weapons? 60, almost 70%, I believe it was, said no. That's an American soldier. You don't fire on American citizens. 30% said, yeah, no problem. Those soldiers I worry about. So what, he be, what happened after that questionnaire came out is, remember in, in, the, in the 90s they began shutting down military bases. They said we had, to, we, had to, we had to, because of budgetary constraints, they shut them down and then reopened them as UN training centers. We have a lot of land in America. Some of our parks, national parks, are no longer national parks. They're owned by the UN and they're called biospheres that as a U.S. citizen, you can't go in there, you will be shot. And there are U.N. tanks, there are U.N. There are concentration camps in America. I mean, all this is out there, all you, all you gotta do is, is research it, it's there. Um, they're planning something, but you know what? Let's go back to the, the rape of Europa. Going back to Europe and get it done. The Antichrist can raise up in Europe. My, my passion is to see that America becomes a sheep nation once again. That we will not follow the Antichrist. Now let's look at a couple of interesting things. Now Doc Marquis does this so much better. But on the back of the $1 bill, that's the signature of the Illuminati. Now, this one guy, not, this is the only one that I could find on the internet, but he actually did the, the, the anagram wrong on Mason. You actually need to start with the M that's at the very bottom of the pyramid on the side. But there is a, one of the most powerful occultic symbols is a hexagram with a circle around it. It's the most vile and most potent of all occultic symbols because it becomes a portal that demonic power can be released from. And there's three of them on the back of the $1 bill. This one's shown here, and I couldn't find someone already traced out the other one on the web. But the, the stars make a hexagram. They're surrounded by what's supposed to be the glory of God there. And then you can take points on the eagle and the shield, and it will make another one. And both of them are encircled. It also adds up to 666 on the back of your $1 bill. If you look at how many times one appears on the dollar, both front and back, it appears 18 times. 18 is the is disguising of 666. And isn't it interesting that they have reworked all the money except for the dollar bill? Because it's the Illuminati signature. Now, Doc goes into it where he shows the owl. Uh, the, the, on the front, you have the one uh, one of the ones up in the right-hand corner has a shield around it. That shield is the shape of the Rothschild sealed. And sitting up in one, in one little corner is an owl. An owl is the symbol of the Illuminati because Lucifer was supposed to be full of wisdom. And so you will see an owl all throughout the occult. It, it is the totem for the Illuminati. At, at the, 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 the um, Bohemian Grove, it's a huge owl that they worship there. It's all Luciferian. Now you can go ahead and, and you know, get the DVDs by Doc because he can also show on the front of it there's owls on the back of it. They're actually in, in all that webbing mesh. If you actually begin to see what's there, there's actually demons stationed to protect the dollar. All because they wanted this to be the new Atlantis. Now, let me hit you with another one. This one I just ran across the other day. Now, in Hebrew, when you want to say, so be it, like when you end a prayer, it's amin. And so, we have been taught that the translation into the Greek or the English is amen. And so, we always end every prayer with amen. If somebody gets to preach real good, amen, brother. <laughs> but if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, and you look it up in its original context, it is an Egyptian god. Amen. 
who was married to Mut, and in fact, a lot of times he, he is called Amun Ra. And so every time we say a prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus, we end it with the name of a pagan god. You see how they have, they have meshed so much into Christianity, that's the reason we're not salt anymore. And Jesus said, if the salt lose its savor, if it cannot preserve society, man will trample it underfoot. And really, isn't man, isn't man trampling the true church of Jesus Christ underfoot right now? We have the governor of Texas. Man, I, that brother can pray. He needs to be president because what he'll do is call a day of fasting and prayer for America. He had people suing him to stop that. Had 38,000 believers gathered, and this man prayed and asked God to forgive the sins of America, forgive the sins over the, over the financial systems and all the stupidity that's been done. I tell you what, we need a man like that. Amen. That's right. Oh. <laughs> so be it. That's the English, that's the English translation. Amen in Hebrew. You know, go to church and say, Amen. They're going to go, Who's mean? You know, they, they, we don't know. They think you're, you know, you know, of course, I'll start praying in Hebrew, but then they'll, they'll really think I'm, I'm whacked. But this, so be it, brother, or somebody's preaching real good. How about, that's right. The Word of God says that their names should never come across our lips of pagan gods. And I don't want to invoke a pagan Egyptian deity at the end of every one of my prayers. I mean, these guys are sneaky. What they depend on is our stupidity. They put it up in front of us. They put all these symbols up in front of us. It's in the advertising. It's in everything because there is a deep psychological impact with it that they can manipulate people. And they put it all there, and they think that we're too stupid to see it because we won't get off our blessed assurances and to begin researching the Word of God ourselves and to find out what is true and to be man enough and woman enough to take the sword of the Word of God and to cut everything off that is of their influence because it is poisoning us. Oh, that's my soapbox if you haven't realized that. I am tired of paganism in the church, and, it, and if you don't endorse some of the paganism, Christians think you're weird. How far have we come? I have had Baptist brethren question my salvation because I would not do Christmas. And to their consternation, I've got Baptist references in the 1800s that would question their salvation because they do. They say, we will have nothing with popery. Right. Referring to the Pope, not the smelly stuff you stick in a pot. <laughs> the women like to put around the house. No self-respecting Baptist in the early, in the 1700s and early 1800s would have ever done Christmas. But see, what they count on, guys, what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. And so what the past generation of believers tolerated and didn't really take a stand on against sin, the next generation embraces that sin. They're not just tolerating, they're actively participating in it, and they have done that from generation to generation to generation because they have a multi-generational plan of destroying the church, weakening the world, so that they can, they can accomplish one world government with one world religion where Lucifer is in charge. Now, why do they teach evolution in schools? I almost put up, I found another one that actually they had a next step, a guy with a huge pot belly with a remote in his hand, and the next one's a pig. <laughs> but why do they promote evolution in schools if they believe in reincarnation? Listen to me well. They know that man was created in the image of God. Yahweh Elohim, not Lucifer. And see, if I'm created in the image of God, that God gives me inalienable rights. 
and I can walk in dignity, and I am to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and everything that has breath, every animal. I, I am not an evolved animal. I take dominion over animalistic instincts and desires. That during the week, and this is something else we need to, to realize, they're actively, generation after generation, trying to create something. We're created in the image of the creator. That makes us creators with a small c. That we need to realize what I do today creates my tomorrow. The stupidity I do today causes me problems tomorrow. The overeating I do today causes me to be belly, belly, uh, bubble belly tomorrow. My spending of money today and not walking wisely causes me to be bankrupt tomorrow. Somehow or another, we've not caught on to that because we have been disconnected that I am in the image of my creator and by following the commandments and statutes and judgments of God, I am creating a better tomorrow for me and my family and for those around me. I'm creating a place where God's presence can dwell. I'm creating a place where his safety can be, his vision, his provision, all those things when I follow what he tells me to do. But when I allow the doctrine of Balaam to get in there that slowly the tares are sown in and the, the poison's sown in, I begin to actually participate in my own demise spiritually and intellectually and financially by following after pagan ways. You see, guys, if you're nothing more than an evolved animal, then you'll act like an animal. Anybody been watching the news? Supposedly one guy got killed, and it, it, it may have been a very unfortunate thing. You don't know all the circumstances of it. Was it that he resisted police, or was it the police were overstretching? We don't know. But it, it's, and there, there, there are people rioting and looting for the sake of rioting and looting. Church, you need to go back and study the French Revolution and compare it to the American Revolution. At the beginning of the, before the American Revolution, the great debate our founders had was not could we have a republic, but were we a moral of enough people to be self-governing? And so morality was the greatest question, not whether we could break away from England. And then we had the great revival, we had the great awakening with, with Whitfield and with, and with Edwards, and we became such a moral nation that the corruption that was going on in England, we could no longer tolerate, and that is what fueled the revolution. God was right in the middle of it, and, and, and we, were, we were walking according to the word of God. Even the Masons and the atheists that did not believe in Jesus respected him for his moral teachings. They respected him and they respected Moses. Highly. But with the French Revolution, they took God out of the consciousness of the nation. Which they began to act like a pack of animals, a mob mentality. One of the things that I was always taught in the military, an individual is extremely brilliant, can be very intelligent, but a mob is always stupid and will act according to its basis na base nature. That they will go and they will destroy anything if fear hits them. Th that mob mentality. And we only had, I want to say maybe 6,000 or 10,000 people die on both sides in the American Revolution. In fact, if you read it, they were cordial to one another. It's like, will you surrender? Yes, I surrender. Lay down your weapons. Would you like, would you like tea and crumpets? You know, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing that was going on. They, they were cordial. In the French Revolution, they took one of the most cultured societies in the world at the time and decimated it to where citizens were raping and cutting people to pieces and all these things. Over 600,000 citizens in France died within a short period of time. 
And so that same concept that if you take God out, you take morality out, if you can kill the salt. If the salt has lost its savor, not only can you trample the church, you can bring that society to ruin. And when you look at what happened to the French Revolution, it totally decimated France, and they ran to Napoleon. You do the same thing in Russia, and they run to Lenin. You do the same thing in China, and they run to Mao. Same pattern over and over again. And they plan for our planet to look like this so that this planet will run into the hands of the Antichrist looking for solutions. And the only thing that can stop it is salt in the earth. Because one of their mottos, ordo ab chaos, order out of chaos, that they want to bring a new order. Remember the, the original on the, on the back of the $1 bill that was not an eagle, it was a phoenix? They got to bring the ashes of everything that is so that a new order can rise up out of the midst of it. And if they get it done in America, it is a failure of the church. It is a failure of the church. We have allowed too much paganism in. We've allowed too much flesh in. We have abandoned the word of God. We've went into hyper grace, which is on the sheer, uh, anybody living by that kind of hyper grace, I guarantee you one thing, they will not be in a cool place when they die. Come on now. Anything goes because I have grace. Paul said we have grace. Is that so sin could abound? God forbid. You're playing right into the Illuminati's hands. When God created the heavens and the earth, it was Yahweh Elohim. Why did God present himself as Yahweh Elohim when, in, in Genesis 2 when he created the heavens and the earth. Why did he use that name? Because Yahweh represents the grace of God and Elohim represents the justice of God. And so that when God created the heavens and the earth, he had to balance grace with justice. And he, and he has been balanced ever since. And the only way that we can have balance in the earth is the church must balance grace with the justice of God. If you abandon the justice of God, you end up right here. Anything goes. That's why almost all preachers anymore, it seems like all they preach about is money. It's because they're preaching Molech. And at the same time, they're embracing Ashtaroth, that they're involved in pornography, and they have all the, their illicit sex is, is rampant in the church. Years ago, I heard uh, James Dobson saying they, they were having a convention, and the, uh, one of the managers was Christian, and he was livid at the end of the conference, which is the, kind of the opposite that you would expect it to be if all these Christians filled your hotel for a week. And uh, the manager says, I don't think I want to have you back. Why? He says, you know, we've had the Democratic convention here. We've had a Republican convention here. But this week, more pornography was purchased in the rooms than the Democratic or the Republican Party did during their conventions. And then we, and anymore, if, if a minister stumbles into an affair or seeks out an affair, we, we're having ministers of God tell the congregation it's none of your business. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me, the pastor and his wife are supposed to be a physical representation of how Christ and the church, that relationship. Paul's very, he shows us a mystery. Right. Now, Moses was not allowed into the promised land because he struck the rock twice when he was supposed to speak to it which meant that one time the rock would be struck, the water would flow out. What, what flowed out of Jesus' side? Water and blood flowed out of his side. But after that, the next time we come to the rock, we can speak to the rock and receive salvation. He struck it a second time, which marred the type and shadow like Jesus was going to be crucified twice. He didn't get into the promised land. Now, what happens to a pastor who has marred 
the image of Christ and the church before his congregation. Just food for thought. Now that you understand the weight of it, he has marred the concept of covenant. Has Jesus got another woman on the side just in case, this, in case the bride of Christ doesn't really uh, fulfill his need? He's got another one on the side on another planet somewhere? You know what? Come on now. But on the 32nd degree in Freemasonry, I can't remember if it's 32nd or 33, it actually has one of the keepers of the royal secrets is order out of chaos. In Islam, they believe that there will be a worldwide bloodbath and chaos like has never been, and out of it will raise up the Islamic Messiah. Same thing. Well, why hasn't somebody been telling us this? Actually, this stuff's been around for a long time. I can go back to early 1900s to two Babylons that Hislop had to write about reminding all the Baptists and the other ones what they used to believe just a century earlier and had forgotten. So it's been here. Guys, our task, there's three tasks that we need to do. We need to investigate everything we do and everything we believe and compare it back to the Word of God. Go back to the Bible. The whole counsel of God starts with Genesis 1, ends with Revelation. The whole counsel of God. Don't dis Guys, don't bring a switchblade to a sword fight. When you disfollow the New Testament, not understanding that it interprets and amplifies much of the Old Testament, and you can't understand it without understanding the Torah and the Old Testament, Everybody's got swords, and you've got a pen knife or a switchblade. How many know you're not going to go very far? And the doctrine of Balaam counts on the fact that you forget the Torah because the Torah is what Balaam got them to forget that caused God to come against them. Jesus in the book of Revelation in two different churches says, I have this problem with you. You have the Nicolaitans, which were just as bad as Balaam, and you have those that hold the doctrine of Balaam. That is an occultic practice to take righteousness out of the church so that they can rule and reign and take the saltiness out of us that we no longer preserve society because we are the only force in our culture assigned to hold them back. If the Illuminati have contaminated it with pagan symbols, ideas, philosophies, it must be discarded and must be replaced with biblical symbols, ideas, and philosophies. It's kind of like with the health care bill, repeal and replace. We've got to repeal a lot of the poison that over the last couple of hundred years have crept back into the church. Get rid of it. Return back to the Word of God. Well, you're trying to make me Jewish, Brother Mike. We serve a Jewish king. Jesus is king of the Jews. He's of the house of Judah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What would Jesus do? Absolutely. He would act just like he did in the New Testament. Yes, he, would. he would act Jewish. He would celebrate the Jewish feast. He would not have anything to do with paganism. And when he comes back, he's going to judge anything that smells, looks, or thinks like a pagan. Do not be there. Only when we discard paganism will we regain our saltiness in the earth. And in the saltiness is the power. Let me tell you something. If somebody is sinning and doing a bunch of this stuff and they say they're moving in the power of the God, they are moving by another spirit and not the Holy Spirit. You always got to look at the fruit. Right. Two, do your homework to be informed. Ignorance is not an option. Ignorance will get you killed in the days ahead. 
You got to know the word. You got to know history. You got to know who you are in Christ, and you got to know who the enemy is. The, the whole thing about the Torah was so that we could tell that which is clean, that which is unclean, that which is holy, that which is unholy. When we disconnect from that basic instruction of God, you don't have a clue about what anything is. You make it up yourself. And I don't care. One of, one of the things people will say is, that isn't what it means to me. Who cares? Really, let's just be, who cares? The only two that count are God and Lucifer. That's it. God says, this is my stuff, and don't you mess with his stuff. And over and over again, the word, he says, don't you ever call his stuff my stuff. I'm a jealous God. Don't be involved in his stuff. Our problem is we don't know what stuff is anymore. We don't. When you have an advertising for a Christian pulpit and there's an ink in the middle of it, we don't know anymore. Accept the call to become the trained of God. That means you're going to have to break out the books. You're going to have to study the word of God. You're going to have to find out what the enemy believes and what their doctrine is and what their symbols are. Number one, so that you don't contaminate yourself with it. And number two, so you can pray against it. And then train other believers in what you've learned. If preachers won't teach it, teach it in your homes. This is not time to worry about hurt feelings or pussyfooting around. We are at the last of the last days. Men need to be men. Women need to be women of God. And we need to be able to say, this is right, this is wrong, and we're all supposed to be apt to teach. This is the hope that's within me. It's time to begin praying and fasting that the body of Christ comes out of paganism and returns to the ways of God to become salt in the earth again. It's going it, to, when Jesus said, when, remember when the disciples tried to cast something out and the demon wouldn't come out? And Jesus, Jesus when he showed up, get. He said, now guys, there are some things that aren't going to come out except by prayer and fasting. And see, that boy was a little Jewish boy. Yeah. Something had happened that the devil had gotten in. And the devil had got, has gotten into the body of Christ. I'm almost of the conviction that he has more preachers in the pulpits than God does. Because they have so compromised. They're no longer like Elijah. They have, they have slowly become the prophets of Baal. Study it. Know your facts. Know your history. Know what's going on. Be informed. An informed person can pray more accurately. That's right. That's right. Guys, we don't want that in America. If the Illuminati have their way, that's going to be in America. Yeah. And I just saw some newscasters this week complaining and saying, our problem is we have the Constitution. Our problem is we're not more like England because they have a parliamentary procedures and they have a parliament so that the majority can always get what it wants. Yeah, they're getting what they want right now. There's no righteousness there. I saw on the news where one, one elderly man was trying to calm a young man down and says, just settle down, you don't need to do this. He got hit by the young man for trying to give him wise counsel. Yeah, that's right. I tell you what will absolutely scare holiness into you is go back and research the French Revolution. That's where they're trying to take us. Anybody ever hear, hear of a guillotine? They used to have a Statue of Liberty right next to a guillotine as they killed people that were in the way of their freedom. And we don't even know where the Statue of Liberty came from. How many know it came from where? France. Do you know who it was modeled after? 
a nun that became a prostitute to save her own self. And she became the goddess of reason in the middle of the French Revolution. In America, we so despise the French Revolution. Who's the guy that wrote Common Sense? Thomas Paine. He went over there, and he, so he got, got tired. You know, we had, we had succeeded with our revolution, so he was going to go over there and bring some common sense. Almost lost his head over it. When they got him back to America, he was called a one-hit wonder in America. He was so despised by Americans that after he got back to America, because he had participated in the filth and the debauchery that was going on, they were gang-raping women before they beheaded them. Untold. 600,000 back then. A good percentage of their entire population. They killed, and the very guy that started the revolution lost his head at the end. They so despised it that they wrote his name on the bottom of their shoes so, they, so that they could walk on his name because America so despised the atrocities that were being done, and they're trying to bring it here. What's our, what's our option, guys? Revelation 18, 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth uh, was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the desolation of demons, or the habitation of demons, and the hold of every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. Unclean, 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 unclean. Demon. That's what fills Babylon. And all the nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath, of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, which meant they left the God of the Bible and began becoming pagans. And the merchants of the, acts were, uh, of the earth were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. You're looking for a rapture? How about an intellectual rapture? How about a spiritual rapture to get yourself out of Babylon before that angel comes and destroys it? This is a clarion call for God's people to come out of the Babylonian system. If I step out of it, it can't control me. Let's look at verse 4 again. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye re not receive her plagues. Well, how, why is God talking to his people like that if we were supposed to get out before then? Now, I do believe in a rapture. I just think it may be a whole lot later than what we've been led to believe. Because what we're not taught historically, there are at least four different times within the tribulation period they believe the rapture is going to be. The newest of all of them is the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, am I preaching against the pre-tribulation rapture? If Jesus wants to come back before this all starts, I'm out of here. You will hear a yahoo as I get out of here. But at the same time, I am preparing to go through a little something. I will not drink of her poison. I will not drink of her fornications. I will not drink of the, the wealth that she has done because when she topples, it's the banking system, it's the money, it's the power, it's the influence, all merchandise. She controls the earth. Oh, you guys still don't get it. You're the, almost, about 80, 90 years ago, Lord, uh, Lord Rothschild said, I don't care who writes the laws as long as I control the money. They control almost all the money. They control almost every government. Do you really think that some of the stupid laws that they've been coming up with on Washington, D.C., those men wrote them? Let's have a health care bill. Poof. Here's 3,000 pages. They didn't write it. Their masters gave it to them and said, vote. 
It's been that way for a long time, guys. On both sides of the aisle. There's a few. A handful. That aren't controlled by the Illuminati. Because they know that either you disappear or you can't get the money to get reelected. Because look at what happens here in verse 5. For her sin has reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. That's the zenith. That, that right there is the zenith when the king of despots comes and he suppresses the entire earth with his fornication, with his paganism. God looks down and says, if you're my people, come out of that. Don't be a part of that. I believe that, that a big part of the reason why we're having the Hebraic roots, it, 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 is a, it is the finalization of the Reformation that started with Martin Luther. Martin Luther couldn't do it because he was Judeophobic. He was. You, 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 he, he was told about the Sabbath before he came to a critical place in his life that he almost destroyed the Reformation because the, the, almost all of Europe was going to become Protestant and the Pope was worried. And this one bishop says, I got it under control. You see, the slogan was Sora Scriptoris, only Scripture. And this, arch, this bishop got up and said, Martin Luther, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. We know that the Sabbath was never changed by God. It was changed by Rome. And because you're still keeping it, you respect the laws and the traditions of Rome over the word of God. And it imploded on itself. But by the grace of God, he had been told it long before. And then his writings, because he got mad at the Jewish people because they didn't come running to him, he wasn't keeping Sabbath, wasn't doing anything. And he said that they needed to be locked up in their synagogues with the Talmuds and they needed to be burnt to the ground. And one day, a guy named Adolf Hitler picked it up and said, thank you, Martin Luther, I think I will. He got salvation by faith, but that's the only glimmer he got. And God has had to take us systematically Take the church out of the dark ages, and we learned about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We learned about the Word of God. We learned about divine healing. We have learned all these powerful truths. We've learned that the, the apostles and prophets are still in the church, that there is a fivefold ministry. We've learned all of this, and God is now adding the Hebraic roots to it so that we can come out of Babylon and be that church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I don't want to smell like Babylon. I don't want to act like Babylon. I don't want to think like Babylon. And God is giving a clarion call for us to no longer be like Babylon. But we've got to realize that everything in our society is based on paganism. There's very little salt left. That when we have a governor call for a day of prayer and fasting... He is mocked, he is ridiculed, and he is sued. Our governor of Texas. There's very little, there's no fear of the church, there's no fear of God. Because we're not salty anymore. We pretend to be. We can shout in here but have no victory out there. We can act real tough in here, but we can't live holy out there. Let me tell you something. It's what you live day in and day out that gives you victory day in and day out. That's right. That's right. If the devil doesn't have anything in you, he doesn't have anything to hit you with. Right. Guys, it's time to clean up our act. It's time to go back to the whole counsel of God. And it's not about being culturally Jewish. How I many know the Jewish people as a whole, they've got some things they've got to go back to the Torah about. They do. There, there are some things in the Talmud that they've added to it, just like Christianity. We've added things to what we believe. And it's time for us to go back to the purity of the book. It's about being biblically accurate to have a biblical life. If you have a biblical life, the Bible will start working in your life. That's right. That's right. And you'll start getting victory. Father God, I just ask tonight that you would just loose within this DVD. An anointing 
to wake us up out of slumber. Father, we have been put into a spiritual coma by the Illuminati and by the occultism in the world. Father, that you would wake us up, that you would shake us up, and that you would empower us to have the wherewithal to strip ourselves of the Babylonian garments. Father, we will not be like Achan that betrays the people of God for a Babylonian garment and some gold and silver. But, Father, we will strip ourselves of these things, and we will put on robes of righteousness as defined by the word of God that Jesus bought and paid for so that we could wear and that we will be salt again in the earth, that we will answer the call to prayer and fasting for our families, for our churches, for our communities, and for our nation. God, I ask that the remnant would begin raising up and see that America would be a sheep nation when it's all said and done. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. 